All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar with Dr. Naomi Barron, How We Read Now, An Author's Journey, because she's got her new stuff coming out that she's excited to talk to us about. Um, we do want to thank our sponsors, H.B. Fuller. Without them, this would not be possible. So thank you to them. Um, what we'll do is we will I will hand things over to Dr. Barron. And if you have questions, feel free to use the chat feature in Zoom. Uh, we'll leave some time at the end for Q&A uh, and you will be muted and we'll, we'll unmute everyone at the end when it's uh, when it is time for Q&A. That way anybody can can speak their question if you're unable to use the chat. Um, and with that being said, I am going to hand it over to Dr. Barron. Good afternoon, assuming we're left roughly on the same time zone. <laughs> Um, it's a real pleasure to, to speak with people from BMI, uh, as I'll explain in, uh, in a moment. This is not my first go around with you, but we share so much in common in terms of caring about making books be alive for people. So let me share my screen with you for um, what I'd like to talk about today, and we can get going. Uh, now let me move this, and now we have room. As Matt said, I'm going to talk about how we read now. That also happens to be the title of the book that I just finished. The reason I've called this an author's journey is we've all been through a really interesting roughly 16, 17, 18 months together. And I say together because from an author's perspective, I've faced a lot of the kinds of challenges that I'll bet you folks have. Um, but let me give you a sense of what it looked like from, from my eyes, if I can get my screen to go, yes. Okay, so the book in question we're talking about is called How We Read Now, and there it is. Got a nice chirpy cover um, that I fought hard to get, but I think at least the color scheme worked out well. All right, the journey that I'd like to take us on for the next 45, 50 minutes or so comes in several stages. I'll begin by giving you a little bit of background about who I am. Some of you have heard me speak before. Uh, and then I'll talk about what's in the journey. I'm an academic, surprise, surprise. Um, have taught for many, many years, done a lot of research on many kinds of language related issues, especially the impact of technology on the way we uh, write, the way we speak. And uh, for the last oh, 15 years or 20 years now, um, focusing on what we do with digital media, including reading. So for about the last 10 years, I've been working specifically on comparing the way we read in print versus on the screen. More recently, you know, call that digital reading. Uh, more recently, I've added audio issues. I don't have to tell you about the surge in audiobooks, plus their audio components such as podcasts that have a real impact on the domain I'll be talking most about today, namely education. As I mentioned at the outset, I've had um, some wonderful opportunities to talk with you folks, maybe some of the same ones on this webinar now in the past, um, in spring 2015, I got to meet a number of people in person. That was good. Uh, I was supposed to do the same in May 2020, but you know what happened then. So um, some of you may have seen the webinar I did then. The journey I wanna take you on, again, from an author's vantage point, is first stage one, the writing of the book, How We Read Now. The second, the really dicey part, the production of that book. And the third, what's happening now in the world of reading? Where from where I stand do I see uh, the challenges lying and what maybe can we collectively do about it? So we'll start with writing the book. In 2015, I published a book called Words on Screen, The Fate of Reading in a Digital World. And I actually spoke in 2015 with, um, with you folks at BMI about that work. But I realized a lot needed to be updated and refocused if I really wanted to make an impact with the research that I and a number of my colleagues have done on comparing the way we read in print versus we read on screen. So there's been much research, and I'll summarize some of that in a couple of minutes, on differences between reading in print versus reading digitally. 
So I wanted to sort of bring people, readers up to speed on that. I also wanted to focus specifically on learning. Um, I haven't been teaching in higher education for a million years for nothing and seeing firsthand, even without doing studies, um, the impact that digital technologies are having on uh, choice of learning materials and the kinds of reading, the kinds of focusing that students are or are not doing. So I'm particularly looking at longer texts, not the kind of thing that might be a one-off of looking at a blog posting or looking at a social media post, but something that's at least a couple of paragraphs, maybe the equivalent of a couple of pages. I wanted to translate the research that I'd been doing into something practical, that people who make decisions, whether it's parents or whether it's uh, teachers or whether it's students themselves about what medium they choose for reading so that the research could make sense to them if I could figure out a way to get those findings of the research to them. Given the rise of audio, I thought it was also important to look at what we know and what we don't know, comparing listening to something auditorily for the purposes of learning and comparing that with when you read comparable material. Given the um, the surge in use of video materials in general, you know, count the gazillion uh, postings on, on YouTube, but also particularly as used in education, I wanted to see what research there was on how we learn from video as opposed to how we learn from text, whether that text happens to be print or digital. I also knew it was really important to have a balanced discussion of what print is and what screens and what audio are particularly good for, but to keep in mind that they're not each in itself the full story. Um, digital has some real advantages. Audio has, you know, audio as digital has some real advantages. Print has some real advantages. It's also important to know that not every reader approaches text the same way. I have colleagues who are, who are philosophers who say, I read everything digitally and I do fine. And I believe them. They also learned how to read really carefully, unlike most of the people who are reading digitally and we'll get to the reasons for that now. Um, I'll also mention that the research for the, this book was all done pre-pandemic and we'll see what that translates into. So what are the major findings? I'll go into details on this in just a couple minutes, but overall, and I, I hedge my words really carefully, uh, but I think that's important because there's a lot of nuance to what we know about reading in different media and the effectiveness of one medium versus another. So overall conclusion, reading in print generally is more successful for learning, I'm putting the stress on those words intentionally, than reading the same materials digitally. And we'll go it through the nuances in just a couple of minutes. I've summarized the findings from my book and then some recent work that's come out after the book went to press um, in, a, in a white paper that I did for BMI called Media Matters for Reading, a report for K through 12 educators. I'll mention now that the same findings really apply for readers of all ages. It applies in higher education and it applies, if you're, it, it applies if you're not in a formal schooling setting, but you happen to wanna to learn something, to remember it. Um, so we'll look at those data, but keep in mind um, the data from different age cohorts show very much the same thing. All right, the findings result from a combination of factors. One of them that you will understand incredibly well is the properties of paper and how we interact with paper. But a second variable is how readers themselves think about the medium they're reading on. So if you wanna take the phrase, is this all in our heads? It's not all in our heads, but to a certain extent, we make assumptions about how we should read in print and how we should read digitally. And those assumptions we make do a lot to shape how much effort we put into how we read in each medium. Okay, just a couple of words about audio and video. Um, if you're talking about people wanting to learn something, audio books can be big motivators, particularly for kids who don't want to read print. And whether that's print that's digital or print in a printed book, they don't wanna read. But if you get them started in audiobooks, you can often get a transition to wanting to read print, um, to ready read text, and one hopes print. 
We also know there are lots of advantages, particularly for people who are early readers or second language learners or people who have reading challenges. And that's not just students, actually, it's adults as well, things such as dyslexia. There are advantages to having um, an audio overlay atop text. And overwhelmingly, of course, that becomes digital text. And there are a number of companies that have quite successfully helped a lot of kids who really have challenges in reading be able to jumpstart their reading and then be able to go to print as well as digital reading. When it comes to video, let's not fool ourselves. Video is really engaging, much more so than an awful lot of print. I'll give you some quotations from students in a couple of minutes. Um, you can show movement in video. It's really hard to do that in text, especially printed text. But when you look at the research on learning from audio, learning from video, as opposed to learning from print, you see overwhelmingly, and I've said typically, but it's a little stronger than that, that learning from print gives better results than learning from audio or learning from video. And the reasons for that are very similar to the reasons that print has advantages over digital. And I'll go through those arguments in a minute or two. Okay, so how do we ask the questions of, do you learn better in one medium versus another? Do you remember better? Do you concentrate better? Do you score better? Um, there are a number of different ways that researchers, including myself, have gone about doing this. Uh, the first is with asking experimental questions. Uh, and what happens is you give a passage, typically of a single text, and um, either the text is in print or the text is on a digital screen. And then you ask reading comprehension questions and you see how people score reading in print versus reading dig on a digital screen. There also are increasingly uh, experiments done with using multiple texts. Um, if any of you have kids or know people who have kids, you'll know that particularly in middle school and high school, there's an incredible push to training students how to read multiple texts online, how to evaluate them in terms of credibility of sources, how to compare materials and so forth. So that's another research domain as well. Okay, second domain is how we give standardized tests. There's been a move now, particularly from places such as the Educational Testing Service, but other standardized tests as well, both in the United States, as well as tests that are native to other countries. There's been a move from paper to doing it digitally. I also want to talk about um, a particular test that's given in the United States called the NAEP, the um, National Assessment of Educational Progress. It's sometimes known as the nation's report card. And we'll see, and that's a standardized test, but of a different sort, namely looking at progress over a year rather than on a specific test where you sit down for a two hour period, whatever it is and take the test. Okay, that's the second source of data. The third source of data is asking students themselves, how do you think you read more successfully? And we'll look at what I call perception studies. That is, these are not uh, looking at a score of how people do on two different media when being tested on their reading, but rather it's asking students themselves and you learn an incredible amount from, ask, from bothering, I'll put it that way, to ask them. But there's another way of asking them, and that is what's known in psychology as calibration studies. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But calibration basically means you ask students either before they take a test, say reading digitally or in print, or right after they've taken it, but before they see their score, how do you think you did? Do you think you did better in print? Do you think you did better digitally? And then you look at to what extent there's a match or a mismatch, that is what is the calibration between the student's perception of how they will do or how they did versus how they actually did. And then there are all these other factors that we won't have time to talk about today, but they really go into the mix as well. How much effort do you put into reading? We'll talk a little bit about that. How quickly do you read? Generally speaking, all things being equal, people tend to read faster digitally, except if they're multitasking, in which case they may read more slowly because they're busy multitasking when they get back to the text and accumulate it. It took longer than reading print where they weren't multitasking. Okay, how much annotation do people do? Hint, 
they do it more in print than they do digitally, even though digital tools are available. And then we won't talk about reading for pleasure, but that's a whole new area, uh, the whole other area that we have to take into consideration if we want to think about reading, because so much of what you guys publish, or gals, um, is uh, reading for pleasure, not just textbooks. Okay, so what kind of people have been sources of input for the kinds of studies I've described? So for the experimental studies, we have things from preschoolers through adult. Most of the data comes from college students, but as I mentioned earlier, the kinds of findings are very similar regardless of age. For standardized testing, the kinds of comparisons of doing a standardized test on paper versus doing a standardized test digitally have largely been for middle school and high school where there are lots of these standardized tests given. The perception data are for secondary school, so consider that junior high school and high school, as well as college. My own research uh, was on student perception with secondary school and college students. And then the calibration, what do you think you're gonna do or what do you think you just did in reading the two medium versus actually how you actually scored, those are from middle school and college students. Okay, so what have we found? As I said, it's a little nuanced, but we, can, we get the same results study after study after study. So it may be nuanced, but it's clear. Okay, reading scores with print are generally higher under certain conditions. If you ask students to read longer texts, what does longer mean? At least 500 words, but maybe 1,000 words, 1,500 words, it depends on who did the study. If you give them a short text versus a longer text with shorter text, roughly comparable comprehension performance on reading in print versus reading digitally. But once the text gets longer, students tend to do better if they're reading in print. If you ask for comprehension questions, questions that involve abstractions, or you have to draw an inference rather than just seeing the information there immediately on the screen, students tend to do better with print. If you ask students to remember details rather than just the main ideas, they do better with print. Um, one of my colleagues, Anna Mangan in Norway, did a really interesting study with, um, with a short story, asking people to read, it was on a Kindle versus in print. And if you ask for just sort of general memory of facts, they're equivalent performance on print versus digital. But if you ask them, when in the plot line did something take place, or where in the story, the beginning, the middle, the end, did an event occur, they do better in print. And that has a lot to do with the physicality of books or, or, or magazines having physical geography to them for a beginning and the middle and the end. Okay, so what kind of reading are we talking about? The advantages of print are seeming to be strongest if there's informational text, that is things that might be a news story, might be a, a journal article, might be a book that does analysis of some sort or another, that the, the differences, meaning, namely the advantage of print are stronger with informational text than they are for narrative. Narrative, think about fiction um, or essays where you're expressing your feelings and belief structures and so forth. Um, and that's partially because you're not looking to remember facts you're looking to follow a story. Although as we saw a moment ago, if you wanna know where in the story and when in the story, you're still probably gonna do better with print. Okay, the perceptual studies. I've done research here, a number of colleagues have done similar kinds of studies. They ask slightly different questions, but the results are all the same. If you ask students themselves, do you concentrate better when you're reading in print or when you're reading digitally. And we ask about reading on computers, reading on, um, on eBooks, reading on smartphones and so forth. They will tell you they concentrate better reading in print. Other times people have asked questions about, do you learn better, do you remember better? Again, depending on the study, it's something like 75, 85, 90% of people, depending on which question and who, who wrote the, the, the survey, uh, say they do better on, on serious learning focused issues when it's print. But if you ask additional questions of what do you like about reading in print? What do you like about reading digitally? And you just get students' opinions. And these are the kinds of things that both um, secondary school students and college students have said. 
They'll tell you, and I have hundreds of these, but these are just some examples. Um, they talk about touch. I can feel the paper in my hand and just the touch and feel of it makes me want to focus more. I didn't make this up. This is what they're saying. Or the sight issue. It's easy to see how much progress you've made. You can put your fingers in the book and so forth. Easy to locate where I was. Now remember, there's a fine function that people can use for almost all digital text. They don't use it. They just keep going, they pl keep plowing ahead digitally. They're much more likely to anyway. Whereas with print, they're more likely to actually go back and find something. And then there's the smell issue. I had assumed that you had to be over a certain age to say, I like the smell of paper. But you'd be amazed how many high school students, college students talk about liking the smell of paper. So keep it up, it's really important. Okay, other kinds of things they talk about, which are a little more subtle, but I think really interesting. I put this together under one header, authenticity and distinctiveness. An incredible number of people said that this is again, students talking about what they like and what they don't like about reading in print or reading digitally. What they liked about reading in print is it's real reading. So they said such things as, feel as if I'm actually reading. It feels more authentic. Um, there was a really interesting study done in Spain by one of my colleagues um, who looked at what happened when you gave computer printouts of multiple articles, as opposed to giving the original sources. So the original sources might be a book, it might be a magazine, it might be a newspaper, same material. In one case, you just have printouts. In the other case, you have the authentic stuff as it was printed. And then you do comprehension tests on reading and people scored higher when they had the authentic materials. And there are a lot of reasons for that, I think. I mean, one is there's a distinctiveness to the materials. I mean, you, you take a computer printout and they look pretty similar. So you don't have sort of landmarks to remember, oh, this was here and this, and, and this was different from that. Whereas you do, if you have different books with different type fonts and different fields of the paper and different covers. Um, and similarly, a newspaper is different from a, a textbook and so forth. Then other people talked about this feeling that I own print. So one student, for example, said, printed media give me a feeling of ownership. You don't put digital media on your bookshelf. And particularly younger students were more likely to talk about this, taking a real pride. You know, I had read Harry Potter digitally, but then I went ahead and I got the print version and I could put it on my shelf. And, and when you could invite friends home, you know, pre-COVID and, and, and again soon, hope, hopefully, I could show my friends I read all that. You don't just whip out your phone and show, see what I read. Okay, hot off the press. Um, some colleagues in mine have been trying literally all year to gather some data from uh, middle school and high school students in the Netherlands at an international school in Amsterdam. And they keep shutting down the school and, and sending people home and everything goes virtual and it's all complex. Finally, literally yesterday, um, I'm not kidding, we got the first batch of data from 11 and 12 year olds. Okay, so these are young kids, right? And I'll just report on the findings on their ability to concentrate on reading. Now it's a small number of people, it's 36 kids, but the findings here are very similar to the findings we got from students at an international school that we collected in spring 2019. Uh, the questions were phrased a little differently. We had a kind of Likert scale of is it easier or is it harder to read in print? Is it easier? Is it easy or hard to read with computers? So if you put together really easy and then the next category, almost 70% said it's easy to read in print when I wanna concentrate. When I wanna concentrate, only 25% said it was easy with computers. So this is, the pandemic's not over in the Netherlands um, as well as here, but it's, but it's, but it's more raging there. Um, so this is new data, students who have been spending a lot of time reading digitally, and they're telling us still, I concentrate much better with print. Similarly, I have some colleagues, um, they remain nameless because they've just collected their data and it's, and it's up to them to get it out and publish it. Um, actually, they base their study on the study that I and my colleagues um, in the Netherlands and in Norway were doing that I just reported out for these 11 and 12 year olds. 
but I've had a sneak peek at their preliminary findings. And what I will say is this is with college students, the data are amazing, and the data were collected about a month ago. The data are incredibly similar to what was gathered by some of these same researchers and the data that I gathered in the mid 2010s, so 2014, 2015, and so forth. Namely, depending on the question you ask, 75 to 90, roughly 75 to 90 percent of, of college students who were surveyed, and there are a couple hundred here, uh, say it's easier to focus, it's easy to remember with print. So the pandemic has not changed people's attitude in terms of their, their perceptions, rather, of how they focus and remember best. Okay, a little bit more on some of the mindset issues on experimental findings. There's a notion in psychology called AIM, which is amount of invested mental effort. That is how much energy do you put into your reading? And this was a study originally done comparing television versus reading, seeing a program on television versus reading a printed, and it was at that point printed text. The people in that original study with television versus a printed text, these were kids, said, oh, it's, it's much easier to learn from the television. I'm going to do better with television. No, they didn't. <laughs> And they said, I don't have to put as much effort into the television as into the print. And it was pretty clear they didn't put as much effort in because they did worse with the television in terms of a comprehension test than they did in um, than they did with the print. So there's this notion of how much effort do you invest? And what's pretty clear in looking at the data, although you can't easily ask people, did you put enough effort into this? The college student would just say, of course I did. But the data suggests they didn't. So if people believe that digital reading is easier than reading text, again, whether it's digital, than, than reading print rather, then they probably are not putting as much effort in and it's showing in their comprehension tests. Um, there's a hypothesis floating around called the shallowing hypothesis that says, you know, in looking at how we read digitally versus how we read in print, that in reading digitally, we tend to take the mindset that we commonly use when we're using social media. We don't spend a lot of time really focusing and memorizing somebody's Facebook update. <laughs> we don't spend a lot of time on these you know, quick tweets. And therefore, if you're spending a lot of time reading those sorts of things, when it comes to reading digital text that actually would merit more attention, you don't tend to spend much effort into it. That is, you have a shallow way of reading. The same thing is, I think, true in terms of seeing video, and I have a colleague in Spain who did an experiment here, um, reading, you know, seeing a video as opposed to reading text. And you do better reading text, probably print, because of what I will call, this is my phrase, video, shallow, video shallowing. Namely, you see it as a form of entertainment. You don't see it as a form of learning. So therefore, why are you focused? Why are you wasting all that effort? Okay, in the perceptual studies, students report such things as, digital text looks longer than print. Excuse me, it's the same number of words, but there's a perception that it's shorter because you tend to read it faster. And if you read it faster, that's gotta be because there are fewer words, right? Uh, wrong, actually. Some students see print as being mentally challenging. So this is from actually a study done in the UK with middle, middle school students. Uh, one student said on paper, there's just too many words on the page and it's too long and you get confused. Or students perceiving digital text as being entertaining and print as being boring. So students saying, digital screens keep me awake. Remember what I said about entertainment for video. Print can tire you out really fast and get boring no matter how interesting the book is. So I think this is, you know, it's not that people were really all focused, and students were all really all focused on reading print and we're careful readers. And I've written a lot about this in my book, How We Read Now, that is we've, romant we've romanticized how much effort people have put into reading. A lot of them really haven't. But it's gotten worse now that digital looks easier. 
Okay, on the calibration issue, uh, I've already hinted what the answers are, that students tend to believe what? They tend to believe they're going to do better on the digital text. However, and the data are from middle school students and the data are also from college students, they generally score higher with print. And they say, oh really? Yeah. Um, and what's particularly interesting to me is these calibration studies are done on a single um, one-off test where here's the passage, you read it digitally, you read it in print, then you get tested. But if you ask those same, and it's not literally the same students, but the same age cohort, do you think you concentrate better, you learn better, you remember better? So that's learning in general. Do you think you do it better with print or with digital? They'll tell you print. So they have a kind of one-off attitude. Oh yeah, digital's fine. I do fine on it. But if you want to talk about real learning, they will tell you they do better with print. Okay, standardized tests. I'll go sort of quickly through this so we can get to some of the other issues. Uh, there's this widespread move to testing digitally for high stakes standardized tests. Um, and the problem is that if you actually look at the scores of students, if they took, let's say, the, um, uh, the equivalent of the SAT uh, in a print version, you know, the standardized aptitude test, well, these days it's called the achievement test uh, that ETS gives for getting into college, um, but equivalent kinds of tests. Um, if you take the, the print version of the text versus the digital version of the text, ETS tells us there's no difference. But actually, if you look at the kinds of student profiles, you'll find there are differences. So who are the people who tend to store higher uh, on the print versions? It's students who have a challenge of some sort. So people who in general have lower reading achievement scores, they'll do better in print than they will in the digital version of the standardized test. English language learners who don't have as strong English skills if the test is an English language test. People who are special education students of varying sorts. And then there was a really interesting study done in Norway um, they were, that, that separated out females versus um, males. And the girls who had really high documented reading comprehension scores from other tests, they did worse on the digital standardized tests than they did on the print version. Hmm. So if everything is going digital, that means we're going to suggest these girls just are not so smart. But we know from other tests, they actually are. So one of the challenges, and I know you got, unless you folks are, are printing standardized tests, one of the challenges is as the world is going digitally, we may not be getting good reads on what people actually know. Then there's this thing called the NAEP, the National, the Nation's Report Card, and they don't do these one-off tests of, you know, read a passage and get tested on it, but rather they do assessment um, in you know, fourth graders and eighth graders and 12th graders on how much progress they've made in reading or in mathematics and so forth. So interestingly, if you look at a correlation between how much people in their classrooms, how much teachers are using digital devices in the language arts classrooms, you know, that's basically English related issues, um, and correlate that with the scores on reading you find something a little scary. So data have come out for the, and then some of my colleagues and I actually analyzed some of these data together uh, for the fourth graders and eighth graders. This is in the United States. And you look at the findings both from 2017 and 2019. And if there was a higher use of digital devices in the language arts classrooms that correlated with lower reading achievement. Now, again, it's complex because we don't know exactly how the digital devices were being used, but at least it should wake us up that, to the fact that using all these digital devices as opposed to using print might not be to students' advantages for learning. Okay, stage two of the author's advantage, of the, of the, of the author's journey, the production phase. Why am I showing you this picture? Um, this is called mud walking. It's a very popular sport in the Netherlands as well as in Germany. And you slog your way through mud. If you've ever walked in mud or done mud walking, you'll know this is not easy. It really slows you down. And you don't know you're ever going to make it without falling on your face. So the production of my most recent book. I've done books before. 
this was my ninth book. I, I sort of know what the production process is like. Uh, I had a contract for this book with Oxford University Press. That's nice. I contracted for it in spring 2019. Delivery date was April 1. I actually made that two weeks early. And pub date uh, was slated for March 2021. And as I don't have to tell you, if you fall off the train in the publication schedule, who knows when your book is actually going to get published? And that got even worse during COVID, needless to say. Okay, and for this particular book, there was in-house editing of the text, but the production was outsourced to a company to remain nameless because I have my issues with them. The communicate, I'll just say they're not in the United States. Okay, the communication process reminded me of mud walking. Everything was in slow motion. But in addition to being slow motion, it was like kabuki theater. So if you know about Japanese kabuki theater where everybody has a mask on and there's indirect communication, that's what happened with the production of this book. So I would write to B, B would talk with C, C would talk back with B, and then I would get the answer. And I'd never had a production circumstance like this. I just walked, worked with the production editor, email back and forth, phone call, same day. No, this would take weeks to get a communication done. And some of that was because of COVID and some of that was because of outsourcing of the production. Um, but it was a really strange, challenging, stress-producing experience. Okay, just to review a couple of the issues. Um, something you probably don't deal with, or maybe you do. Preparation of an index for the book. Typically, uh, the author doesn't produce it. Um, the, um, the publisher hires a freelancer, um, and you expect there to be differences in the vision of what should be an index um, from what the author's vision was. Okay, so I just decided I want to make sure this book gets done. Everything is going in slow motion. I'm going to do the, a draft of the, of the index myself. So I spent about a whole week pr producing all the categories. Okay. But when the indexer is so many layers removed and I couldn't communicate with the indexer and it would take a week or two to get any response back and the indexer, let's just say, lived in La La Land, I didn't know this book was ever going to make its production schedule. I also started thinking about halfway through because the indexer came up with an index that had nothing to do with my book. I assumed she didn't actually read it. I don't know where she got her categories from. Um, I said, does anyone even use an index anymore? Because if you read the book digitally, and yes, a lot of people read it digitally, you don't use an index, you use the find function. But I said, I'm going to do this because I still believe in indices going to make it happen. Uh, long story short, uh, the indexer failed me. Uh, the production company <laughs> failed me. And I redid the index entirely. I put in the page numbers myself. You can imagine how long that took for a longish book. Um, we were a month behind schedule. And then, OK, we're going we're, we're gonna to get back on track. We're a month late, but we're going to get back on track. Um, the, uh, the typesetting, as it were, was done in India. But guess what? There was a cyclone in India, so everything shut down. Okay, finally, by the skin of our teeth at the end of December, I think it was the last day of December, we made it and the book was published. And um, if you look in the front of the page of the book, it's LSE Communications uh, who did it. And I thank you very much because you did a lovely job. Okay, the kinds of questions that an author asks, should I have released the book during the pandemic? because the reader's choices are really fickle out there. Um, you couldn't browse bookstores, that's just starting to come back, but the book came out, the official pub date was middle of March, and in essence, it came out the end of February. You couldn't browse bookstores then. The public wasn't into reading about general interest topics, even though reading is something everybody does and moving digitally and and you, you, can you stand being on Zoom anymore? Uh, that was on every, everybody's mind, but it just, it, it wasn't a topic that was getting the kind of press that my earlier books had gotten. So the publicity venues were still so preoccupied with politics, remember that was going on, and with COVID-19, that I didn't know whether I should have released the book or held it for six months. Okay, then there's a question of reviewers. 
And the irony is ordinarily publishers send out, um, you know, uh, print releases um, to reviewers, but they don't send out print anymore. They only send digital, even though this book is about why reading in print is so important. Uh, but my fun fact to share is, um, as you may know, um, publishers ask authors, are there some influences out there that are some people, if we sent a free copy of the book to, would talk it up? So I gave them a list of roughly 20 people throughout the world. And uh, they said, would you please ask them, do they really want the print or would digital be okay? So I, you know, straight faced as it were, I asked them all, which version would you like? And they all wanted print. Hmm, that says something. Okay, stage three of this journey. And I'll go through this quickly because I'm gonna leave some time for questions. I wanna talk about trade sales and how they have changed. And you probably have the statistics as well as I, but I've been charting them uh, by month by month and then over the last few years, year by year, to talk about print versus eBooks and adults versus children and young adults. I also wanna talk briefly about textbook revenues because what's happening in the textbook world has been radically different from what's been happening in trade. You probably know this in terms of your, your own sales figures. Uh, some of the challenges in the education world, both K through 12 and higher education and what the heck do we do? Okay, so if you look at the statistics from the Association of American Publishers for 2018, 2019, and I'll share the actual figures in a moment. Um, there has been a steady decline for those two years, both for adults and for the children, young adults in eBooks. And that's been a continuing trend. This, this is trade books really, about 4% a year. Again, we'll look at the specifics. Um, the surge on eBooks really came um, after the Kindle and then the iPad became established. So call it 2010-ish for the iPad. And then there were triple digit inflation uh, year on year for three or four years and uh, of ebook sales and then the decline you know first a radical decline and then a gradual decline of three four percent a year um, during the pandemic here are the sales figures you can read them for themselves hardback was selling uh, paperback was selling ebooks were surging for understandable reasons downloaded audio was also surging continuing its march Okay, so what does this look like? Do not expect to read all the details first here. I mean, what I've charted is month by month as I go on to shelf awareness and put in the data because they have more details than the, than the stat shot of AAP does on its website. Um, but what I want you to, reds are declines, but what I want you to look at please is the bottom of the chart, 2018, 2019, children's, young adults, eBooks, that's the first column. You see the decline. And then hard book, uh, children, young adult, hardcover, paper, not mammoth growth, but you know, some. Um, K through 12 material is sort of all over the map. Adult eBooks, again, you'll see that decline, which is very similar to the children's young adults eBooks for 2018-19. Um, adult hard books and papers, um, some growth, you know, some decline. It depends on part on, you know, what the, the political bestseller of the day is. 2020, go to uh, young, children's young adult eBooks, this incredible surge. And then, an and then let's move over to adult eBooks, again, a surge. Who knows what the future looks like? I'm just delighted that we didn't have overall for 2020, um, a dramatic drop in sales, but, um, it, it, you know, but we don't really know what the future looks like, but we can get a hint for the education side by looking at policy decisions, policy decisions of publishers and policy decisions of people who are adopting texts. And you see this in your sales, I'm quite sure. So K through 12, um, Pearson and Houghton Mifflin Harcourt um, are seeing lots of digital growth. Why? Because they're pushing it, right? This is even pre-pandemic. Higher education, um, because I live in that particular world, I have seen the push of publishers to make things go digital. What's interesting is the money part. So I came upon a site, and you'll see the reference on the next slide, that Moody's had dropped McGraw-Hill and Cengage's credit ratings in August. In August. Um, that's got to be 2020. 
my mistake. Okay, forgive that. I'll have to correct that. Um, and you might know more about credit ratings than I because you live in that world, but it didn't seem like a good thing to drop your credit rating. However, there's major there was major growth. Again, that was 2020, again, my mistake, um, in the second quarter for digital revenue. And then some things from the report that I will give the reference for in a moment. The new emphasis on digital learning approaches that address student costs and offer more flexible approaches to curriculum are already beginning to repay higher ed, ed publishers years of investment in digital learning solutions. For publishers who manage the short-term challenges of deferred textbook orders and shrunken COVID-19 and book publishing overall budgets, it appears that an acceleration of digital learning solutions could provide a lifeline into the future. And that is exactly what is happening in higher education, namely in K through 12, as well as higher education, the investments have been in digital technology with COVID-19 for K through 12. There was all that investment in technology. They had to do it. I'm not faulting anyone. I'm not faulting anyone for having so much of the reading go digital during the pandemic. But there also is pressure of publishers to keep this up. Now that there are these incredible budget challenges in terms of state funding, in terms of retrofitting schools, getting internet access, getting digital devices for students, I don't know that we're gonna go back to any kind of a sane balance between print and digital. But add to that, the lack of, and I'll just read it, student, teacher, administrator, parent awareness of the research on the learning implications of reading and print versus on screen. Okay, higher education. There's all this pressure from the publishers to say, guess what? We can give you much less expensive books. Digital is just fine. Okay, so there's the inclusive access program that a number of the major published textbook publishers for higher education have. We'll give you everything we publish for a reduced price, digital, Faculty care a lot about the cost to students. Um, a study that was done in late 2020 showed that more than 50% of faculty think that students don't purchase textbooks because of the cost. And that has been true actually in previous years as well. And it's true, my students will tell you, I can't buy the book, I don't have the money, um, I'll get it from the library or I won't acquire it, period. Okay, the pandemic effect. Um, there was a study done in early 2021. This was the 2021, where they surveyed faculty, surveyed faculty and also surveyed students. Um, who favors print textbooks? Only 25% of the faculty in the, in, in, in the study said, yeah, um, print is good. Around 50% of the students said it. So this goes back to the issue of, do you listen to what the students have to say? They're the ones who are doing the learning. They're the ones who are in school. And if we don't listen to them, what are we doing? The faculty say print's not as important because they care about cost, not because they believe learning the two media is equivalent. And then the last uh, bullet I have here is the same one I had for K through 12, lack of student faculty administrator awareness of research on learning implication. They don't know what the issues are. So what can we do? We can share the research we have on reading media and BMI is doing a bang up job on trying to get the word out on this. Okay, we need a clear eyed view of the appropriate roles for both print and digital for education. Digital is gonna stick around. We have to figure out how to rebalance the media. That is, this is not digital bad, print good, it's what's good for what. And we have to, in my suggestion, uh, and I actually plan to undertake some of this with a colleague in the year ahead to translate this research into action, to find ways of training teachers to learn what the research says, to develop curricula that, that use digital for where digital is really good and use print for where print is. So I thank you very much and I look forward to questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Barron. Um, Anybody has a question, feel free to either unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Um, <clears throat> if you go to the BMI website, there's links to the white paper Dr. Barron mentioned, as well as some public opinion polling that, that BMI undertook with the help of a number of sponsors uh, <clears throat> that, that kind of just dovetails right into to all of those statistics that, that Dr. Barron was able to share. So. Uh, make sure you're you're checking that out on the BMI webpage. Well, while we're waiting for people to ask questions, I'll ask one of you folks. 
I've spoken from my own perspective about what's happening with textbooks, and I know what's happening in higher education better than I do um, for uh, adoptions of print versus digital in K through 12. But you know what your printing is like, you know what the marketing is like. I'd love to hear from you what you're seeing in anything that's in the education space. Dr. Barron, I guess I would uh, mention on the, we do a, a, a fair amount of printing for school K through 12 publishers and uh, heard from two publishers in the last month. They are yeah. seeing a surge in requests for print material. Now, some of that could become they ran because they ran their inventories down, but uh, they also freely admit that they've made the product uh, more costly for schools. So it used to be if you bought the digital, you'd get the print for free because they figured no one wanted it. Um, <laughs> and they also figured it was since it was more expensive, now they've moved to a model where if you buy the digital and you want the print, you have to pay for the print. And they're still seeing a surge in request of print materials, mostly work text, soft cover books from their, their customer set. So we're seeing a uh, sort of a spring spike in, in demand for printing for K through 12 uh, materials, which is great okay. to see. Okay, so is this more workbook type things as opposed to a textbook type things? Yeah, they're calling them work text. So it's a consumable Fine, got it. that they're trying to, uh, not, okay. the, not the core, you know, gotcha. own hardcover textbook. But, uh, right. So this reminds me of something that's happening in the, um, oh, my brain is gone. I, I just came back from Iceland two days ago, so I haven't yet revved up my brain. Um, so for, um, books that are freely available um, digitally. Um, okay, somebody help me. <laughs> I'm having, what is the name of freely available books for the move? Open Come source? Up, open, so op, open access books, thank you very much. Okay, so um, there's been a big move in education, particularly in the United States, although to some extent in other countries, to make books for the available because textbooks are too expensive. And the expense of the textbooks is not your fault. It's, it, it has a lot of other factors behind it because I know something about the cost of actually producing the book, which has very little to do with the price tag that is stuck on it. Okay, but from what I've understood from some of my um, colleagues is that for particularly lower school, Schools print out the materials because for young kids, having print has been understood to be really open educational resources. That's the phrase I needed, thank you. Um, has been really important. For middle school and high school and college, the students are overwhelmingly using them digitally. But what you're saying particularly about uh, K through 12, and I'm guessing it's the younger kids, resonates very well. The other thing that I suspect is at work is there's been a lot of discussion about how little learning went on over the last year and a half. And the question is, how the heck do we get our kids back on track? And kids goes up through college here. So maybe there'll be a perception that print is going to help anchor that. I don't know that. I don't know if anyone else is having experience in terms of the orders you're getting for the fall. No, that, that, thanks, Dr. Barings. That, that makes sense to me. And I know that uh, it was, my, my kindergartner had more of those consumable work texts, I think, as, as Dave mentioned, where it was the learning was in there, but then he could color in them, write them out, and it was, it was a consumable, whereas my fifth and seventh graders did, did not have the, the, that kind of same same text but uh one question that came in dr ben has there been any any difference or have you been able to segment research uh by public schools versus private schools or homeschooling uh has has, in a, has that been looked into at all no but i will take a different set of data and make a hypothesis <laughs> Um, depending upon what state you're in or what county you're in, uh, during the, uh, you know, so let's go back to spring 2020, as well as fall 2020. A lot of the private schools were able to stay open. Again, it depends on the jurisdiction as to whether they were or not. If they were able to stay open, there wasn't the impetus to have to get everything pushed out digitally. So my hypothesis 
is with private schools that were able to be open, so it's a twofer, that there was much more use of print materials. And that with public schools or in counties and or states where, the, not, where, where private schools were not allowed to operate, there was much more use of digital. So if one were doing standardized tests on how much educational gain or loss was there, I think we will find the private, over the last, you know, we'll call it year and a half, I think we'll find that the private schools that were able to stay open had much less learning loss and more learning gain. And I can't tell you the exact details on that. Um, and in part, that's because not just they were face-to-face -face and they had um, socialization possible, but I suspect it was also they had access to at least some print books and they had access to libraries. So one of the questions that um, we asked in my, in my colleagues in my survey um, about using libraries and that my other colleagues who are working with college students asked is a lot of students said, I really missed using the library. Now with college students, much of that material is available digitally. So when they say they missed using the library, they're talking about using not just space where you can sit and hang out with other people, but being able to see print books. So the students again are sending us a message that they understand something that the administration, sometimes for cost purposes, may not get. Hey, Dr. Thank you. Barron, this is um, Mike Collins. Can I just ask a quick question? Uh, <clears throat> your two actions about promoting and sharing the reading research to build awareness and, and to clarify the best applications for print or digital, do you have any uh, uh, experience or guidance for our for BMI or our companies on which organizations or groups are doing a good job at that that we could either work with or support or are there any organizations or initiatives that you see that are really working towards uh, those two uh, two actions you outlined? Uh, I wish <laughs> um, and I, I, I say I wish because I probably know all the people in the business who care about this. Um, probably the, the organization, um, and I'm just writing a note to myself. Um, there's a woman by the name of Pamela um, Della Pietra, who is at SUNY State University of New York, Stony Brook. And she started an organization called, I think it's officially called Children and Digital Screens. You can find it. And she's done wonderful things with hosting conferences of people um, such as myself and just lots of researchers who are really studying what we learn, what, what people learn, um, what their stress levels are, uh, and all kinds of other factors with reading digitally versus reading in print. And she uh, hosts a number of uh, webinars, and she's done that throughout the pandemic. And if you send me an email, I'll send you her contact information. And um, that would be the organization, and, and, and Matt probably has it as well. Matt, do you have the, her contact information? I don't think I have hers, but I'll connect with you, and, 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 and we'll, get, we'll definitely get, get on top of that. Yeah. And that is the organization that cares most and has a huge number of all the right researchers associated with it. What I otherwise know is that nobody, nobody except one or two colleagues in their own classrooms, nobody is, has figured out that we have to get this message out to real teachers. So if any of you has any bright ideas on how we can partner with a school system or even with an individual school or with school administrators to find a way to get the word out to, to put together workshops for teachers in most states in the United States, maybe all of them for accreditation. You have to do um, in-service training for teachers. There are ways of doing weekend workshops. So, you, know, you, you can make it all up. And that's what needs to be done. It's really got to happen at the grassroots level. It's going to be easier in some ways, however hard it is, with K through 12, with universities, which I know best, as I've said, I haven't a clue how to get their attention. 
because the cost of the books to students is making faculty say, I can't do this. So there are a lot of faculty, you know, surveys have been done. I'd rather use um, open educational resources that might not, I mean, so, some are really good books, but some of them are trash. I'd rather use a book that's not as good as the print, but it will cost less than my students can't afford to buy or refuse to buy. And therefore we're gonna take the digital. And now with, um, with um, various of the, the inclusive access programs, the cost has come way down for some books um, and getting faculty's attention because it's, it's school by school is really hard. So I think the K through 12 space has a better shot and I'd be happy to work with anybody who wants to help me and a colleague of mine, Kristen Halvey Turner, figure out how to do this. Hey, I, Matt, I know you're out of time, but I would offer Mike to that point. I had a, a, a colleague of mine at LSC that took the research um, that uh, we had posted on BMI and the polling and posted it on their LinkedIn page. And this is someone probably like most of us, they have a LinkedIn page that just has their information and they really then go look at it. Mm -hmm. They went back the next day, they had 1500 people that had all <laughs> the story. They thought they were an influencer all of a sudden, but they said it was incredible. Yeah. Everyone yeah. said, we agree, we agree, we agree. So it's, I think it's up to us as well as BMI to get the word out that this is important stuff. Right. Yeah. So and and, let me and know just, what I can do. no, and, and thank you, Dr. Barron. And just so everybody knows, we've, as I've mentioned in, in other webinars and things, BMI has really put a big push behind this research, behind the polling, uh, and, and we've had a number. We have a number of sponsors who have helped make this this possible, um, predominantly with with LSC kind of leading the charge. But we've we've been able we've pushed stuff out to the Association of School Boards, the Association of Superintendents. Uh, this is going out to Simra, uh, you know, who are the instructional uh, folks, instructional materials folks, and we are constantly in 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 looking at ways to get this out broader uh, and more widespread you're going to see social media posts from bmi both on linkedin and uh twitter so if when you see those again retweet share amplify that message uh and, and we're going to continue working on this uh as much as we can and and i agree with dr baron is in terms of it's got to be uh, just trying to get to the right people at the right times with the right message. And it is very much grassroots. Unfortunately, there's, there's no, uh, you know, well, I guess I'll stay out of the political front uh, when we talk about the, the department of education and, <laughs> and, and everything that's going on there, but, but we will continue to, to push this and, and try to get this message out in front of as many people as we can. And, and one of the things we'll do is, is again, this, this recording will be up on the, on the BMI YouTube channel. Uh, you, you all will get an email about that, share that wide. Um, you know, I think the, the, the material that we just had over the last hour, was invaluable and, and is a great message for anybody. So, so I encourage everybody to do that. Um, and, and having said all that, again, thank you to our sponsors, uh, HB Fuller. Thank you to Dr. Barron for her time and all her efforts around this research and helping us uh, get this message out. And I know I've, I've, I'm working with Oxford University Press and Dr. Barron, and hopefully we will have copies of the new book available to those who come to the annual conference in person and you will get a physical object uh, when you arrive. So, um, and, and whether Dave knows it or not, he's probably volunteering to print those for us, but, but we'll figure that out. Uh, thank when you the in time advance. Comes. <laughs> so thank you everybody for your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, and we will see you all soon. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, doctor. <laughs>